Hello everyone, my name is Xavier and I'm John and for our extension learning we wanted to learn more about a new type of statistical analysis that is becoming popular in the game of baseball called sabermetrics. Now as we all know baseball is considered to be America's pastime and it's also a game like many other sports that relies heavily on the use of statistics when it comes to evaluating player performance. Oftentimes we hear about a certain player hitting so many home runs and RBIs during a season but what does that all really mean? Now baseball records have been held and recorded, which translates to baseball statistics since the early 19th century. But it wasn't until 1947 when the analysis of baseball statistics began, when Brooklyn Dodgers GM Branch Rickey hired the first ever baseball statistician named Alan Roth. This led the way to the growth of a whole new dimension of baseball analysis, in which a man named Bill James created through published work in 1977 called Sabermetrics. Now, why would Bill James spend so much time on this idea of sabermetrics when statistics are supposed to tell the true nature of a player? Well, like most statistics, they could be useful, but it could also be very misleading when it is taken out of context. When looking at specifically baseball statistics, a lot of it really doesn't have to do with the true performance of a player, but it rather depends heavily on being given the opportunity through contributions made by a player's teammates. We'll look at an example of this later, but it has been shown that traditional statistics are overvalued and it doesn't really show a very accurate representation of a player's true performance. This is where the idea of sabermetrics comes into play. Sabermetrics questions the basic assumptions of traditional statistics and it attempts to use stats to analyze and apply it to make more accurate determinations when evaluating a player's performance. Bill James describes sabermetrics as the search for objective knowledge about baseball. You may ask, why are statistics so important in baseball? Well, it is the basis when it comes to building a quality baseball team. Since there are literally thousands of professional baseball players available, a team can only put 25 on a major league roster, so they must be carefully selected on who they choose to be a part of a team who gives them the best chance to win. This process can be very complicated when it comes to player scouting, since many factors need to be considered. Some of these include players' previous achievements, experience, raw skill and talent, age, and potential. Also, a team must be balanced with three main aspects of the game, which are hitting, pitching, and defense. As mentioned before, a team can only have 25 roster spots, and that includes eight position players, one pitcher in which there is usually a rotation of about five starting pitchers, relief pitching to back them up, and then bench players for extra depth since a baseball season lasts 162 games, injuries are bound to happen. Another huge factor is the payroll of a team, which varies depending on the team's ownership. Some teams have high payrolls since their owners are willing to pay the money, whereas other clubs have lower payrolls because they lack the budget to pay so much money for their players. Here's an example of the MLB salaries in 2002 in which the book Moneyball was written after, which we will talk about later. As you can see, the red bar indicates the Oakland A's, who was a team of focus in the book. They had the third lowest payroll that year. Now compare that to the New York Yankees, who had the most, which is about three times as much more than the A's. For obvious reasons, you can see how having more money is advantageous, since they have the ability to sign better players who require more money to pay for. Now that we've gone over how a baseball team is generally made, we're going to briefly talk about the basics of traditional statistics and how they're used today. Like most sports, statistics are what shows a player's performance during games. Higher statistics generally correlate to better performance such as points scored in basketball or touchdowns made in football. In baseball, the popular baseball statistics for offense include batting average, runs batted in or better known as the RBIs, runs scored, and home runs. For pitching, popular stats include wins, earned on average, or ERA, and strikeouts. Here's a summary of those statistics and a brief description along with how they are calculated. Since this is pretty much general baseball knowledge, we won't spend too much time on it, but you could pause the presentation to look at the description of each statistic if you aren't familiar with it. Now this brings us to sabermetrics. As we mentioned before, a man named Bill James created sabermetrics to honor SABR, the Society for American Baseball Research. This society's mission is to foster the research and dissemination of the history and record of baseball while generating interest in the game. 
This can be joined by any baseball fan. Now, Sabermetrics, which is created from statistics, is only made possible because each game produces so much recorded data. Oftentimes, you'll hear announcers during baseball games say ridiculous stats like, this player is hitting 450 with runners in scoring position during night games when the opposing team has four or more runs. Of course, this is a slight exaggeration, but it isn't far off some stats that are generated today. It goes back to how much data has been recorded over the long history of the game. The main idea of Sabermetrics is to attempt to provide an improved and more accurate measure of a player's performance and contributions to his team. To keep it short and simple, Sabermetrics is applied statistical analysis to player evaluation. One example of how sabermetricians see the flaw in traditional statistics is the interpretation of the RBI stat. An RBI is when credit is given to the batter when the outcome of his at-bat results in a run scored with the exception of hitting into double plays and when errors are made by the defense. Now, when you think about this, a lot of this stat adds up when it depends on how other teammates perform. In other words, in order for a player to hit an RBI other than hitting a home run, his teammates need to be on base. This relies heavily on the amount of opportunities given as opposed to raw skill or performance. Sure, RBIs may indicate a player's ability to get a run in, but is it fair to say one player is better than another when the person with more RBIs simply had more opportunities? Thus, Sabres are convinced that RBI is not a good measure of an individual's skill. Some sabermetric examples that we're going to talk about are on-base percentage, or OBP, slugging percentage, win shares, wins above replacement, also known as WAR, and fielding independent pitching, also known as FIP. Most of you probably have never heard any of these since they require very complicated formulas and are also very difficult to understand. Anyone can understand that 73 home runs in a season is a lot, but what about a war of plus 8.9? The first two we're going to talk about are on-base percentage and slugging percentage. On-base percentage, or OBP, compares to that of the traditional statistic of batting average. The flaw with batting average is that it doesn't take walks or hits by pitch into account. A common baseball saying is, a walk is as good as a hit. The formula for OBP measures how often a batter reaches base. As you can see, the average OBP is around 320, whereas an OBP above 400 is considered to be excellent. This means a player will reach, on average, 4 times out of 10. In other words, he will fail 6 times out of 10 and still be considered excellent. Slugging percentage is very similar to batting average as well, but it measures the power of a hitter. Slugging percentage puts weights on how many bases a batter is able to reach safely on his hits. The formula shown shows that a single is only multiplied by one, whereas a weight of four is applied to home runs since it requires more power from the hitter. A third formula that is also popular is OPS, standing for on base plus slugging. This simply adds OBP and slugging together to take both on base and power into account to make one sabermetric value. So we're going to talk about a sabermetric called wins above replacement, or in short, war. This sabermetric could be the most popular one because although various statistics or sabermetrics should be used to fully evaluate a player, war is an all-inclusive and it provides a handy reference point. War basically summarizes a player's total contributions to their team, which results in wins. War is a ridiculously complicated formula that should be looked up if you're interested, but it is ultimately expressed in a wins format. To keep it simple, war basically factors in offensive, base running, and defensive sabermetric values in runs above average, along with a positional adjustment due to the complexity of certain positions over another. These numbers are then converted to a run value based against an average replacement level player, and then it is converted again into wins, where 10 runs equals one win. War basically answers the question, how much value would the team be losing if a player got injured and replaced with an average replacement player? So an example would be, a player with a war of plus 5.3 translate to a player that contributes to 5.3 wins above a typical replacement player and level of production. It would be wrong to say that a player creates 5.3 wins when playing on the team and not injured. Most analysts say war is the best sabermetric available 
at capturing how much worth a player is. To put the war saver metric in perspective, this graph on the left basically breaks down the distribution and difference in war of 944 major league players in the league in 2010. As you can see, only five players had a war above 7.0, which is very impressive. About 38% of the league had a war between 0 and 1, which is about average. The chart on the right lists the rule of thumb for war and what it translates to. You can see that a 6 plus war is considered to be MVP-like, whereas a scrub has a war under 1. It should be noted that it is possible to have a negative war, too. The final saber metric we're going to talk about is FIP, or Fielding Independent Pitching. The whole idea of FIP is to measure what a player's ERA should have looked like over a given time period, assuming that performance on balls in play and timing were league average. The unique thing about this Sabre metric is that the variables taken into account in the formula are the only outcomes a pitcher has total control over. As mentioned before, baseball is truly a team sport, and one player cannot win a game for his team entirely on his own. We talked about it offensively with the RBI stat, but with pitching, pitchers depend on his defense to make plays when balls are put in play. FIP takes out these factors in the formula listed, which include only home runs, walks, hit by pitches, and strikeouts, the only things pitchers are able to control. It should be noted that the constant is usually around 3.2 and is just used to bring the numbers to, to an ERA scale. Also, a large sample size is needed for FIP in order for it to be effective, such as a season's worth of innings pitch. Generally speaking, a player with a FIP around 4 is around league average, whereas a FIP around 3 is considered great. One book and movie that we both read and watched is called Moneyball. It is written by an award-winning author named Michael Lewis. Most of you have probably heard of or seen this movie as it received an Oscar nomination for Best Picture. This story basically chronicles the low-budget Oakland Athletics and the effective use of sabermetrics by their GM, Billy Bean, which is played by Brad Pitt in the movie. Now to fully understand the mind of Billy Bean's success, one must understand the history and experience he had faced that reflects his current philosophies. Before becoming a successful GM of the A's, he was once drafted out of high school as a very promising baseball prospect. Instead of getting a full scholarship at Stanford, he chose to be drafted by the New York Mets in the first round of the 1980 MLB draft. Now, scouts at the time primarily used traditional statistics with looking for intangibles to evaluate a player on whether or not he will become successful. Scouts had thought that Bean had a lot of potential because he was better equipped to deal with the pressures being in the majors, which is the highest level of professional baseball. However, he didn't perform up to expectations. After a few years going up and down between the minor and major leagues, Bean thought that his character did not fit baseball at all. Therefore, even though when he was entering his prime, he decided to retire as a professional baseball player. Instead of leaving the baseball world, he wanted to use his past failures in order to help a team recruit better. He decided to become a baseball scout for the Oakland A's and eventually he was promoted to become the general manager in 1998. Bean's way of picking players to be on the team was definitely unorthodox at that time. He did not believe in traditional baseball statistics. Instead, he took a sabermetrics approach and believed on-base percentage was the most important statistic. Since he was dealing with such a low budget, he had to strategically make moves that were often criticized, such as trading away a player that is highly regarded in terms of traditional statistics for players no one has ever heard of. However, these players of unknown had high OBPs and were relatively cheap since no one else knew who they were. This approach also allowed Bean to sign and trade for, in his opinion, talented players for cheap, making it very cost effective under his lower than average budget. Since being promoted to general manager, the A's have won six American League West Division titles. They also set a 20-game winning streak record in 2002 and have recently won the division, despite having only a $68 million payroll. This compares to other teams in the same division with significantly higher payrolls, such as the LA Angels and the Texas Rangers with a $142 million and $127 million payroll, respectively. 
Another man who has proven success of sabermetrics is the father of sabermetrics, Bill James. In 2002, he was hired as a consultant for the Boston Red Sox. At that time, the Red Sox hadn't won a World Series since 1918 and felt their city was cursed. Since his hire, the Red Sox have won three World Series titles in the past nine years, including the most recent one. The 2004 World Championship ended an 86-year World Series drought. Needless to say, the proper use of sabermetrics works and is very effective. Controversy between traditional statistics and sabermetrics is a constant debate when determining the value of a player's performance. One downside of sabermetrics is that it's sometimes inconsistent. Since sabermetrics can be interpreted in different ways, people like to put their own weights or add certain factors over others. An example is that Fangraphs.com takes defense into account when calculating war, whereas another baseball source called Baseball Prospectus does not. This results in highly regarded defensive players having significantly higher wars under Fangraphs.com than Baseball Prospectus. So there's always a question as to who is more right or accurate. Another example to the many downsides of using strictly traditional statistics is one of Ruben Sierra's season during his baseball career. In 1993, Sierra had recorded 101 RBIs, which in most cases indicates a very productive and quality season. However, looking deeper into his stats, it shows he had only hit 233, his OBP was only 288, and his war was a dismal negative 1.6. Needless to say, Sierra had a rather disappointing season despite hitting 101 RBIs. This probably had to do with him hitting primarily in the middle of the order, which allowed him for more opportunities to hit RBIs. This is a major flaw in the statistics general assumptions, which was mentioned earlier. So to summarize, baseball statistics should be viewed as simply a tool to help understand the game better. Traditional statistics are not very informative when it comes to player evaluation and can be very misleading since it does not take into account other important factors such as opportunities. Should a player with 100 RBIs but 800 at-bats or opportunities be considered better than a player with only 50 RBIs but only 200 opportunities? That's where Sabermetrics comes in, which is applied statistical analysis to player evaluation. This up-and-coming way of looking at players is proving to become more efficient. Today, new formulas are constantly being created and improved to make sabermetrics even more accurate. In the end, the all-end goal of sabermetrics is to find the objective knowledge in the game of baseball.